Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fastlight Space Group. Really excited to have a really wonderful guest here today on a topic that is very close to Fastlight's uh, interest. I just when I go, always go back into our archives, it's full of light sales. Uh, and so that's really cool. Can't wait to talk about this more. I just do want to remind folks that are in this group that we have Vision Weekend coming up. So Vision Weekend is our annual like end of year festival. Many of you are already joining, but in case you are not attending yet and you do want to come, there is an application form for subsidized attendance for both of these events. One is going to be in a castle uh, outside of Paris and one is going to be in San Francisco across three iconic by area locations. And we're basically discussing all of our different technological tracks. So from long-term history and coaching futures, longevity, rejuvenation, chronics, molecular machines, newer tech, but also a very big focus on energy, space, and expansion. So if you want to meet other people uh, in this group and across different spots that interest areas, then please uh, do join these meetings. We have a subsidized attendance form there uh, in which you get highly reduced ticket prices. And that is for people in these groups. So please do apply. Really excited um, to see so many of you here at these annual meetings. And with that, without further ado, I'll be handing it over to Piyad, um, uh to introduce our speaker for today. So thanks everyone for joining. Oh, look at this. We've got all my favorites in the audience today, Carol and Larry and Luke and Adam and uh, Ben. Excellent. We have the great good fortune today of having Kevin Parkin, a very old dear friend of mine who unfortunately I haven't seen much of recently, but, but we worked on a, together on a daily basis for years at NASA Ames when we were both uh, there. And um, I'll, all I can say, because Kevin doesn't allow me to praise his intelligence, so I will not do that here. But what I will say is that it, it, if, if it's like super cutting edge engineering space, engineering plus space plus software, it's Kevin. So I think he's going to be talking about some of that today. Kevin, do you just want to launch him for presentation or do you want me to ask some questions and do it that way? I thought I was going to just launch into it and then you were going to probably chime in as we go That's along. Great. That would That's be wonderful. Great. I may occasionally interrupt with a clarifying question, but I, you're a professional, so let's just go at it. Excellent. Thank you ever so much for the invite to talk. I thought that I would talk about what I've spent most of my sort of cycles thinking about for the last 20 years, which is three things. Thermal rockets, actually, first, which I'll explain, inference engines and light sails. And so just three simple topics. And these are the questions, when I was putting the slides together, these are the questions I hope they answer in no particular order. So let's kick off with thermal rockets, which is a topic that, that Creon, I think you probably remember quite well. Um, oh, yes. Let me first explain what a thermal rocket is. A thermal rocket is a rocket where you have taken the combustion out of the rocket. So rockets use chemical energy, energy that's stored between a, a fuel and an oxidizer. And that energy source is what puts, puts stuff into space, and you release it uh, through combustion. But thermal rockets actually dispense with the whole combustion process, and they take in energy from outside or, or from nuclear reactions, say, but it's not chemical energy. And I'll explain why you want to do that in a bit. But the way it works is that uh, you have a heat exchanger of some sort on board the rocket, and you still have a propellant, but the energy is absorbed by the heat exchanger. The heat exchanger gets hot. And then it is transferred into the propellant. So you have this hot, high pressure propellant, and then it's expelled through a nozzle the way you would for any sort of combination of gases that you produce by combustion to produce thrust for a rocket. And the reason you do this is because you can bypass the, the fundamental energy density limits of conventional propellants. So you can put more energy into each unit mass of propellant than you can by combustion. That's Fun, the basics of it. But the way that this works with directed energy is that you have a beam director on the ground, a beam facility. And that beam facility, there's a minimum angle over the horizon that you can get to. So what you do is you have a launch vehicle that's acquired by the beam director, and it, it's a high power spot, like a radar spot that follows the rocket through its ascent trajectory. And it's, yeah, so you follow it through the ascent trajectory and then you release the payload. That's the way it works. The, this, the thermal rockets are not the only approach. There's actually pulsed approaches that go uh, with pulsed detonation cycles in the microwave and the laser regime. So, so the first of these and the, and the most well-known is probably the pulsed laser light craft that was invented by the late Kantrowitz and Minovich circa 1970s. And there was a, 
uh, a large amount of effort that went into characterizing this and examining it just shortly after lasers came out. And then in 1992, Jordan Kerr, my, my friendly rival, proposed a laser thermal rocket, which used uh, continuous wave lasers. And then 10 years later, I came along and, and proposed to do the same sort of thing, but with microwaves. And then there is a, a pulsed sort of version as well that was suggested by the Kamurasaki group at the University of Tokyo. So why do this? It's a very elaborate way to put something into orbit, but why would you want to do it that way? And there's two figures of merit in propulsion for this situation anyway. There's the specific impulse on one axis here. This is the amount of kick you get per unit propellant. So the more kick you get per unit mass of propellant, then the more you're getting for the, the sort of mass of propellant that you're carrying up with you. So more is better on that front. And then you've got thrust to weight ratio on the other axis. If it's not, if it's not more than one, then your propulsion system is not forceful enough to actually overcome gravity. So on the left here are the original chemical rockets down here at the bottom. And they initially sucked. They had terrible specific impulse and terrible thrust to weight ratio. But after not very much time at all, they got a lot better. And by the way, can you see my pointer here, Creon? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so there is this line of engines here that reaches this sort of limit. And then we have another boundary that goes up here to the Merlin engine, which is really fantastically good thrust to weight ratio. That's like the boundary of the state of the art of, of chemical rocket engines. And this limit that they got to on the specific impulse is the limit of hydrogen oxygen rocket systems. So there's this, and it's this energetic limit. It's like how much energy you can pack into a propellant that is still stable enough to launch the rocket without detonating or not dissolve the launch pad in the case of hydrogen fluorine. So there was another generation of rockets that used a nuclear reactor. And these are thermal rockets. So they got rid of combustion and they used a nuclear reactor that was integrated with a heat exchanger to, to heat other propellants. And these achieved much greater specific impulse, but lower thrust to weight ratio. And down here for completeness, you've got propeller aircraft, and then you've got jet aircraft. And it was a real breakthrough to go from propellers to jets, enabled a, a whole different sort of regime of flying. So even though it looks like not much distance on this graph, these differences really transform transportation. So with thermal systems, what we're looking at is up here and with directed energy systems. For thermal rockets, depending on the propellant you choose, you can start to have very high thrust to weight ratios and specific impulses in the nuclear thermal range. And so when you combine high thrust to weight, high specific impulse, you get a much greater payload for the same amount of rocket that you're buying. And so it's, a, it's the economics of it. And the ratio of payload to, to dry mass, so the empty rocket, it's all of the machining of the parts necessary to go into the structure of the rocket, but it's the part that, that you don't care about, you only care about payload. So that ratio changes. So you've got three, six, 12 times more payload per unit dry mass of the rocket. But that's not the only advantage that you have, because once you dispense with combustion, you only need one propellant, not two. So you only need one pump. You only need the whole parts chain to deal with one propellant. You can make it inert so that it doesn't explode. And also, yeah. Just to be clear, it's the idea is that with these thermal rockets, whether they're nuclear or directed energy, microwave or laser, you don't need to carry an oxidizer, basically. Is that the thing? Yeah. Yeah. You just need to carry one propellant and it simplifies the rocket, but also it has higher performance, so much so that instead of having to drop stages as you go up, you can go to a single stage to orbit rocket. So you don't have the same range constraints. So you've got to combine, you combine all of those advantages and depending on how you're feeling that day, you get between about a factor of 10 to a factor of 100 cost decrease in the cost of launch. And to show you how that sort of breaks down, this is a conventional LOX hydrogen sort of rocket where it's mostly tank, a little bit of payload and the engine and stuff like that. If you go to a thermal rocket, now you're looking at a rocket that is mostly payload uh, by mass. And so there's huge advantages to doing it this way. And is this... Think, is this know, is this dry mass or wet mass here in these pie charts? These pie charts, uh, there's no propellant, so it's dry mass. Okay. Yeah. What was I going to say? Yeah, there's a huge advantage to doing it this way. And all of the savings that you make uh, through doing conventional rockets cheaper 
when you're ready for another factor of 10 or maybe even 100, uh, this is the, the thing you can do next to save on costs. So you can do a, a cost benefit analysis and you can say, if I take all of the market um, with this launcher that, that, that launches payloads to wherever you want, up to 20 metric tons, what, how cheap does the, so the, I would say the big capital cost part of all of this, by the way, is the beam director. It's the thing you build to direct a beam from the ground. And nobody really doubts anymore that you can do these thermal rockets. The question is, what's the initial cost? And there is a cost of the beam director, at which point this makes economic sense based on the market. So if you capture all of the market, it turns out that it's about $22 per delivered watt, where it makes economic sense. But if you're a pessimist and you say, we're just going to take the tiniest, the, the tiny payloads and the tiniest sliver of the market, you'll get a value more like one dollar a watt. Wait, so that's but, the payback? That's the payback if you put in... That's the threshold. Uh, so it's the price like of, of microwave or laser sources when they're, after they're integrated into a beam director. So let's say it costs $100 million and it's 20 megawatts. So you divide that 100 million by 20 megawatts and that's your dollar per watt here. It's your capital cost. And it's the price that you, it has to reach for it to make economic sense to do that. Why is the optimistic price higher than the pessimistic price? Because you're assuming that you get 100% of the market, that everyone's just, oh, there's no reason to do it the old fashioned way. And so if everyone does it, it makes economic sense at $22 a watt. So it's all in, but it's a technology push because you're going to be spending all of the initial money to do that. Anyway, so there's an economic analysis that you can do on that, but the advantages are huge. So the US government spends over a hundred million dollars a week on space launch when you work it out. And so there's an enormous amounts of money going through and you can save most of it. Although in reality, probably what would happen is that you would just do a lot more with the money that you have. So in, in terms of progress on the thermal rockets, as I said, uh, my friendly rival, Jordan Kerr invented the laser thermal rocket in 1992. And then 10 years later, I looked at the problem and, and felt that microwaves were cheaper, basically, and that they had some advantages relative to lasers. And so we had the, many discussions on the merits of doing it one way versus another, and we thought that eventually we would converge uh, and find the optimum. I guess over the years, the concept evolved. So this is uh, Jordan's concept for uh, a laser beam director, which is modularized, containerized, very elegant beam director that can get some number of megawatts to the rocket. And then about the same time, this is me toiling away in a lab at Caltech, finally showing with a microwave resonator that you can get energy into a tube and exchange it into hydrogen. That's actually hydrogen coming out of the top there. I put uh, table salt at the top so you can see the flame. And I think Creon about 2010 is where you come in, right? Yeah, yeah. I was trying to be helpful, so I'm not sure if that turned out to be true, but I was definitely into the 2010 to 2014 timeframe. Yeah. So that's when it all got very interesting. So we had the, the NASA study. Jordan was involved. Lake Mirabeau of laser light craft fame was involved and I was involved. And we, NASA really tried to understand the merits of this. And there were various studies at this time. And then a, a few years later, we were approached by DARPA who said, we want you to build one now. Here's $2 million. Do you think you can reach orbit? I think it's basically what they said. And I said, I, I don't think so, not for that, but we can demonstrate a lot. And so we did. We actually, I'll get to this, but we did. And we reached the point where we were able to do some first flights of very small microwave powered rockets in 2014. But one of the, one of the big things that we did first is we built a lab that you could bolt onto the D3D fusion reactor in San Diego. And the first thing to do was to show that you could absorb a millimeter wave beam uh, into these ceramic tubes that we were going to make the heat exchanger from. And it, it's not an easy problem to figure out how to make a ceramic tube absorb millimeter waves strongly, but it turns out the trick was to put this carbon coating on the inside with a thing called Aquadag that they used to coat the insides of old TV food ray tubes. But using that, and actually it was a one megawatt system, but we pulsed it so it was down at 20 kilowatts and we could heat ceramic tubes up to their melting point, basically up to 1800K. So this was a great victory. And then we immediately, because it's a DARPA program, we Im immediately pivoted to phase two, which was to integrate that uh, into a heat exchanger in a small rocket and test it. So now we're at Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. And what you're seeing here is called System Zero, actually. 
So this is the microbe source here, and the rocket is on, on here. And there's the beam directors. This is the scheme by which you get the energy from here onto the rocket, onto the heat exchanger, just to demonstrate all the various parts of the system at small scale. And so the way it works is that there's a beam that comes up here onto a dish, a Cassegrain dish, and then onto this reflecting flat optic here, uh, which we had an actuator behind, so you could point it uh, directly at the rocket here. But then the rocket's going to move as it takes off. So we had a tracking camera here that looks through the same optical path and has the rocket in its field of view. And then what you do is you extract the position of the rocket from that field of view, and as it moves up a pixel, you can have a control system that then moves the turning flat so to keep the rocket stationary in the field of view. So we made a, a cooperative target millimeter wave beam director to track the rocket. And then we integrated the rocket. Alex Brookleary, a student of mine, integrated the, the heat exchanger into a rocket. And this was the result. We had a, a millimeter wave beam that heated the heat exchanger. And this was just a, a blow down cold gas system. But we wanted to show that by uh, having the gas go through the heat exchanger and heating the heat exchanger, that you could increase the, the thrust as a result. Just show the sort of basic physics of it working. And this is in the infrared. Um, but you can get it up to melting point. But I think we, we went a lot less than melting point here. And so that's, we basically got as far as that before the program ended. So where things stand then and now, actually, is we reached about where Goddard was in 1930 or so, where you've got this altitude of a few tens of meters. My, my co-PI still holds the record for the beamed energy stuff at 71 meters. But we've reached like low altitude. We demonstrated some of the fundamental technology and spent about, I don't know, 10 million, on the order of $10 million. So we're in 1930 now, and that's where it is with thermal rockets. But, but the, the conclusion of this program, we demonstrated basically that the heat exchanger technology was nearly there, that you can do this all on the fluid mechanics side. The real challenge was to, uh, is to get uh, a, a beam director. So to get lasers or microwaves and integrate them cheaply enough so that you could form this beam. And so that's where it's at. But also the other challenge was simulating everything and showing that you could do this. And this is issue item number two, which is inference engines, which are related with simulating the microthermal rocket, you have a whole flow path that you have to show and you have to calculate. You have all of the various masses on the rocket. And similarly with satellites, you have oh. these very complex designs. Well, excuse uh, me. You... Yes, Larry. Could, could I ask a question before you move on to that topic? Yes, by the way, it's um, good to see you. So have you considered the application of the, of, of the thermal rocket to in, into atmospheric hypersonic Fanciful, like hypersonic gliders, as an example, because again, you could totally bypass the whole supersonic combustion problem in a very elegant way, right? And, and you wouldn't need as as much delta V to still have a big impact. That's an interesting thought. I'm. I think that originally, just before uh, I actually came up with the micro thermal rocket idea, that was one of the ideas in the mix. There is is to do a a, a sort of thermal atomic cycle. But as you say, you can just avoid that whole regime. Yeah. And the simplest thing to do and the easiest thing to do first was the thermal rocket where you're just heating a heat exchanger. Nobody really doubted that. But there was, let's see, there was the Ajax hypersonic system, uh, which was an energy bypass engine, a magnetohydrodynamic one. And, mm -hmm. and there were some ideas on, on how you would instead send energy from the outside and use that to improve the sort of those, those cycles. Okay. But it's more complex. Kevin, uh, yeah. I asked something to say when you go into the inference engine stuff, which is a very interesting, of course, these days, everyone's going to think by default, you mean AI, large language model stuff. So be, be sure to. Yeah. Let's draw a distinction here. There's AI and then there's machine learning. AI is inference. Yeah. So, so if this, then that. It's not the chat GPT related stuff. But the reason that I was interested in inference engines is because I had to simulate the microthermal rocket and it gets very complex. You get these models of 10,000 variables or more. And the same thing happens with satellites. So you have this managing complexity problem. And I don't know, for all of you that program, 
do you ever have this feeling when you're writing code that you've written this routine a thousand times in just very slightly different ways and that you just can't use the old routine for one reason or another? You feel like you are the superposition of a room full of monkeys just doing things over and over again. I very much had that feeling at, at that time, probably what, circa 2008 or so. And I think I'll after a few glasses of wine, I think if I remember correctly, I told Pete Warden that I thought that I could come up with a better way of doing this engineering software. And, and this is the result. There are three types of knowledge. Procedural, here's how you do something. Like it's functional composition, like call function one from function two, and you get this chain of functions. You'd specify the procedure to carry out. And it can be conditional. And then there's declarative knowledge where you're just like, this is my knowledge base. These things exist. And third generation and fourth generation programming languages are all procedural, right? You write functions that call other functions and they do stuff. And fourth generation languages, you, you have a knowledge base and you have the computer decides basically how to call one thing to call functions and, and how to propagate information through, through your piece of software. I think that we've been doing it all wrong with uh, representing engineering information. We have been writing a lot of software that's third generation where let's say that you're designing a rocket or a satellite and you're representing that procedurally. It's just, it's a combinatorics problem. Every time something changes about the way you design the rocket, for example, let's say you can design a rocket by specifying the pressure and the conditions in the tank and propagating it all the way out to the performance on the outside of the rocket. Or you can specify the performance you want and propagate that information all the way back into the inside of the tank. The solution procedure is completely different. You have to completely rewrite the software to solve it a different way. And so when you have these complex systems and you need to explore the designs and solve it a different way, you end up in this infinite do loop of writing almost the same thing over and over again. But that's not how we think of the rocket. The rockets are objects and they have properties. And it's a failure of information representation to do what we do with the way we write software. And you can actually do a lot better, which is what I'll show you now. So I'm going to switch tabs here, hopefully, and show you this. Uh, hopefully you can see this. Yes, I know it's a bit small. Growing okay, tree. good. This is all of the models that, that I've written in the inference engine. It's actually an ontology of models. Let's see, I, uh, it's got like orbits down here and things like this. These are uh, object-oriented self-inferring models where information is represented inside an inference engine. Basically, it has a, a database of functions. And let's see. All right, let, let me just hold that thought for a moment. So originally I, I had to explain this with a lot of hand waving, but I'm going to try and do it graphically here. So this thing is special relativity, believe it or not. This is representing the equations of special relativity. Actually, just this one variable is E equals MC squared there. They're actually, because energy and mass are the same thing, they're the same variable here. Um, but there's momentum over here. And this is the speed here. Basically, everything relates to the speed. So I can make an instance of that model. And I can say, all right, I have a particle. And it's going at 80% the speed of light. And then it's inferred all kinds of things just about Doppler shifts and things like that. Basically, all of these quantities, this whole variable got specified. But then I can say, OK, I want it to have, let's say, a rest mass of one atomic mass unit. So it's be like a proton or a neutron or something. So what is that? It worked out from that information what the kinetic energy is and the momentum. You see those arrows. So in blue is the stuff we entered. In black is what it inferred from that. And you can see from the objects on the left there, okay, let's say it's also moving at 1G and it'll infer the whole model of the force. So it's, it's shown you the direction that information is propagating through this network, or you can change your mind and say, I want a kinetic energy of a thousand MeV. Uh, the arrows all change directions when information propagates through the network a different way. So what it's basically done is it's done all of the functional composition for you. It's that instead of you telling it what function calls what, it just takes the inputs that you give, looks in its database of functions and calls them in the right order in order to solve the problem. And that way you don't have to rewrite the software every time you change the boundary conditions. So Kevin, one quick one. This has, if you just look at it for the very first time, it has certain aspects of symbolic programming and certain aspects of constraint-based programming, uh, which is a classic thing that people have mostly forgotten about. Is this a new thing in some no, ways? No, it's not new. 
It's not new. It's just, it turns out when you try to write a piece of software, you're not where you're not in this do loop of solving an equation of state every different way or whatever, you end up with inference engines. It's just a forward chaining inference engine. But this one's customized to, to do, to handle engineering information and, con and it has a whole ontology, like a, a foundation classes, but of engineering knowledge that you just get taught in universities. But you can build models out of these building blocks here. Okay, uh, one, in fact, one, more, one more brief. Yeah. So does this, these hypergraphs and these direct graphs of propagation, do they have to carry units with them and make sure that everything is consistent or is that just built into the graphs? I didn't build unit consistency in there, but you could build it inside this system. It's basically any kind of information you can write functions for and propagate it solves. So I what is, one, sorry, one more question. What does it do if you're trying to change the direction of propagation and it's, there's no explicit form for the equation and you might not even know if there's a solution or multiple solutions or something like that. Okay. It, it does not improvise. Uh, I haven't made it so that it improvises and notices a gap in the equations and tries to solve anything. As far as it's concerned, functions are black boxes. It, it knows a function by you specify inputs. And if there is a function in its database that has just one variable missing and it, it's able to, to call the right function to infer it, then it does it. Thank you. But uh, yeah, when you're doing iterative solutions, though, it actually watches, it, it builds its own iterative routines to then solve. It watches what it does, picks the stuff that it only needs to solve on every loop, and then builds algorithms that go any number of levels deep. It turns out that you can write some very computationally efficient solution procedures that way. And so it, it gets you a lot farther than with conventional techniques. But let's, we're back in the presentation now. I didn't realize. Okay. Yeah, this is another Can I example. ask one more question here? Yeah, sure. All right. Yeah, good to see you. It's been years. Does your system now handle situations where your functions are non-monotonic or discrete, where basically you can't invert them easily and you end up with multiple solutions, et cetera? That seems like it could get quite complicated. Yeah, so when you have a function like that, usually you're parameterizing it with some other variable that you don't really think about. If you've got multiple solutions, you can, let's say you've got a quadratic equation and there's really a hidden index, which is an integer of zero or one that tells you which manifold you're on. So it's, you can always have a unique solution if you parameterize the function correctly. Quick, quick question. Have you done anything with drag being factored into it as well? Oh, there's, yeah, there's. There, yeah, there is a drag model in there, actually. It, it has an MSIS atmospheric model somewhere hidden in the background for some of these models, and you can really get an accurate estimate on drag. This is an orbit. So, so if, if you Google for orbit calculator, I think this comes up as number four now on, on the results. But this is just one of the basic models, and then there's other models that build on this, and there's drag calculations. I don't know if it's in this one, but it's in the 3D model. Um, but there's uh, examples that you can run and, and see how, how to use it and how it works. But I'm not going to get into that right now, I don't think. I'll uh, switch to the next topic, uh, which is light sales. Also, uh, so I'm systems director for Breakthrough Starshot, uh, which means that uh, I have the task of making sure that all of the pieces of the Starshot project fit together. But for, let me first explain what it is. Um, so, so Breakthrough Starshot uh, is an initiative. It's a $100 million initiative to send uh, a probe to our nearest star, Alpha Centauri, uh, just a very light probe, uh, maybe a gram or so, uh, and take images of our nearest star and relay them back to Earth. Uh, and to do it uh, in a human lifetime, and, and that's really hard to do. So to do it in a human lifetime, you have to go at relativistic speed, uh, actually 20% uh, of speed of light. So the sequence that the, this is, and, and it turns out you can do it with existing physics without having to invent any new physics using laser-driven sails. And so the way that would work is that you would launch a sail into orbit and you would acquire it with a beam that's directed from the ground and you would accelerate it for a period of time until you've reached the cruise velocity. Uh, and so you cruise through space for 20, 22 years at 20% at light speed uh, until you pass through the Centauri system uh, at which point you image whatever you find as you go through the Centauri system and then send the data back to Earth, which you can do with laser communications. So it's all known physics, but it's not necessarily, not all of it, known engineering. And that's where it gets really hard. So that's the concept for, for Breakthrough Starshot. 
Using the inference engine, there is a, a Starshot system model that's actually in there, and it's, I don't know, it's probably like 30,000 variables, 40,000 variables, which includes the relativity model that I showed you, and orbits and various other things. These are the inputs to the Starshot model, and they'd have to do with like the speed you want, the wavelength of laser you're going to use, like where your sail is starting from, what payload is, and what the costs of all of the pieces need to be. And the model is a, an economic optimizing model, so it minimizes things. And it, it spits out point designs and cost-optimal point designs. So you can build a, a laser that is capable of doing this for, this is interesting, this thing is driving itself. So yeah, built a laser for less than $10 billion, which is the constraint that we were given. And it tells you how big the sail needs to be and how fast it, it accelerates and things like that. So it's that are the unknowns that, that then fix the system and you know how big to build the beam director, which is big, it's 2.8 kilometers. But that's what it needs to be in order to be able to send a sail to our nearest star at 20% of light speed. And just to show you what that looks like, this is what a four meter sail looks like that, is, that has all of the functionality that's implied by that. It's four meters and it weighs 3.8 grams? Yeah, because it's uh, 100 nanometers thick. If you have, probably the closest thing is actually sometimes the coating you get on window glass. If you could peel off the coating you get on window glass, it would be like that. But it doesn't stick to itself because in space, things charge up, especially at relativistic speed. So it's actually got this sort of elliptic self-repulsion so that it's flat or you can spin it or do both. And when you're accelerating, it's a reflecting a portion of the beam back to the ground. So you have a very intense beam. Actually, the amount of pressure that's on the sail is like a summer breeze. You could blow on your hand and that's about the amount of pressure. But the breeze that's coming from photons is moving at light speed. So it's like throwing a very thin plastic bag into the wind. It accelerates very fast, actually 15,000 Gs. And yeah, it just keeps going for as long as it's riding that beam. Kevin, we have 20 more minutes. Do you mm -hmm. want to wrap up your part of the presentation and move to Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the beam director. I've got two more, more minutes of this and then I'll be done. Uh, so this is the beam director. This is what's implied by that. So you need to make an optical phased array. This is an element of it. It's probably a few centimeters across. So it's an array that's built of these things. Uh, it uses a beacon to correct for atmospheric turbulence so that you're able to form a focus in, in orbit and uh, you basically entrain the light sail and then accelerate it for 10 minutes. And then once it's in cruise and in interstellar space because of dust, you have to turn it sideways so that all the dust misses. And then you eventually reach the Centauri system. This is a point designed for a, a mission, a near term mission to prove out the technology within the solar system. So it turns out you can do some amazing solar system science with a system like that. You can send probes out in, all through the solar system, very small probes, but very fast. You can start to think about passing Mars in two days, going through the heliopause in a year, starting to explore the Oort cloud and try and get some dust measurements and other things, measurements of magnetic fields in interstellar space, the things you'd need to do a full interstellar mission. And the inference engine, of course, uh, is used to produce these mission point designs. Uh, and I apologize, this is an eye chart, but it's to make a point, which is that every point on this chart is a mission. It's a cost-optimized mission, and it's looking at all of the quantities like the capital cost or the acceleration over a range of like speeds, like everything from not very interesting to light speed and payloads from like an amoeba all the way up to many times the International Space Station mass. So it's looking at the whole range of what you can do with this. It turns out uh, this one, this, uh, what is this graph here is actually acceleration. This white line is about 1G acceleration cost-optimal. So it turns out you can contemplate future human missions uh, with a system like this and the, um, the point design scale in that way. And so I've uh, done some exploration of that too, but these performance maps are publicly available. That's the link and uh, more information on human missions is actually coming up in a, a book chapter that's being released soon. Uh, and I'll leave you with this. This is a visualization of every star that you can reach basically with a light sail. The stars that you can reach, I've colored in pink, because pink is an underused color in engineering. And yeah, it'll just pull back. But as this, is, you'll see basically what scale you can reach in a human lifetime. If you can go at 99% of light speed, which you'd likely will eventually be able to do with a light sail. And, and with that, I'll open it up to questions. Okay, so I'm gonna ask the first one or two, and then we have another 15 minutes or so. So 
I just want to say one thing. So I worked with Kevin for a number of years on some of these projects, millimeter wave thermal launch. And to some extent, I was observer of his inference engine progress years ago. And I have to say, another thing that Kevin did was he turned me onto this book by Bouchard, I believe, on nuclear rockets. And yeah. when reading that book, because it's this nuclear book. Rock, yeah, that book, which I, when reading that, I think I might have even gifted that to you, but be that as it may, maybe you've had your own. Anyway, nuclear rockets have a lot in, nuclear thermal rockets have a lot in common with beamed energy thermal rockets. And what I noticed from reading that old book from like the 60s or something like that was that there'd be a chapter on the nuclear reactor and it had all these equations in it for how you calculate stuff about the nuclear reactor. And then there'd be a chapter on the, the heat exchanger and it would talk about how you c compute all that stuff. And then there'd be a chapter on the end rock, the engine itself and the combustion chambers and the pumps. And it would have bunches of equations for how you calculate all that. And it occurred to me that engineering is really done by coupling together these models and flowing things all the way through and trying to get the answer that you want and then going back and changing some things and couple, flowing it through again and trying to get the answer that you want. And even computers can help a little with that. But the process is this sort of laborious process of turning coupled equations and then other coupled equations and other coupled equations into a whole system model that you can then actually explore. And so that was when I saw what the inference engine was all about. Like it automatically couples this stuff together and then it allows you to specify certain things as fixed. And then it shows you the other things that aren't fixed, it might show you graphs. And then if you specify some of those things, it'll you can see, I'm sure, in our presentation, what have you got? Beamed energy launch, which used the inference engine for designing all these different things, the beam directors, microwave propagation heat exchangers, rockets, then the inference engine he talks about. And then he talks about Starshot, which is beamed energy launch, where he used the inference engine to optimize the system and help you make your choices. So it all is really tied together. And uh, I want to thank you, Kevin, for doing it in three parts that are all tied together. And with that, perhaps we can open it up to questions. I think since the chat is a little bit scattered, Perhaps someone can just maybe raise their hand on the screen. Or... We have one from Micah already raised his hand. Right, great. Yeah, we, Allison, you're better at this than me. So why don't you? Uh... Yeah, I, I saw that one flash past. <laughs> this is about dust impacts and whether they damage the sail. And the answer is yes, they do. And you have to design for that. So the best way to avoid dust impact is to turn the sail edge on to the direction of motion. And, and actually, uh, it turns out that you can you can make a stable sail with flat optics so that when you're cruising through into stellar space, you can turn it exactly sideways and edge on. So you can avoid things, but you'll still get some dust impacts. Uh, and those will just punch their way through the sail. It's a, it's a hundred nanometers thick. What you'll get is it'll be like a, an instantaneous deposition of energy in the sail that will vaporize a small part of it. And you just have to have redundancy and design for that. How much does that slow it down on its cruise? N not at all. Almost none. Yeah, all of the gas, the whole column of gas and dust all the way to Alpha Centauri, when you calculate how much it slows it down, it's absolutely negligible. But actually, uh, your kinetic energy when you do that is your main source of energy. You have, I think it's an order of magnitude more than the nuclear binding energy of uranium, just as specific kinetic energy of your light sail. One of the most interesting things is what can you interact with the magnetic field, the ambient interstellar magnetic field to tap that energy rather than have any batteries on board at all? Because if you can tap that, then all batteries are dead weight. Yeah. So that's great. Yes. Yeah. Alternator generator thing. That's super cool. Now, someone asked, how do you slow down? Like you'd like to slow down when you make your flyby. Is that just off the table? And it's just you get what you Yeah, can. ideally, yes. But it turns out physics doesn't work that way. I think it's quite difficult to slow down. But the economics of making one of these lasers is in your favor anyway. I guess you could view it as a glass half full, half empty thing. But you can't, you basically, it's, it's a capital cost of about $10 billion to build one of those. And then the energy cost to send a light sail is more like $5 million, $6 million. Yeah, so you like wouldn't a, use it just once. And, and you, the sails themselves are presumably potentially quite inexpensive. But isn't the Starshot plan to have a whole bunch of them? Yeah, why wouldn't you? It, it's just the economics of it lend itself to, to, to just sending one out weekly for years. So what you'll do is you'll send one out weekly for 20 years, let's say, and you'll effectively have stopped in the system 
because you've just got all of these light sail one a week going through. And first, what you'll see is you'll see a few points of light as you go through and you'll be like, wow, I missed that by a long way. But then it will relay those points of light back to the next light sail that goes through the system. And that will use it to figure out where the orbits of all the planets are. And you have a little bit of maneuvering ability uh, with the light sail, especially if you do it a long time ahead of time. So what you'll be able to do is start to map the system, figure out where all of the rocky bodies are, and select where the, the trajectory of the light sail so that you get a close pass. And then you'll start to see continents and other features if there are planets there. And you can start to gather data sets over time, extract features. And there's this sort of autonomous decision act cycle that you can do, and you can actually explore the entire system. It's like a self-driving car, but this time a self-driving spacecraft, and you can do it all before the first data ever reaches Earth. Okay, Alison, you want to call on people? Yeah, fascinating. I'm totally blown, still processing. But yeah, we have Micah next uh, with a question. For the beamed energy launch facility, can you build one relatively inexpensively that could just put like a toy rocket into space, or is basically all the cost the same, whether you're putting a toy rocket into space or a starship? No, actually, that's exactly what we looked at for the rockets. We were trying to find the minimum scale because that's what you would do first. You're not going to build a grandiose multi-ton launcher. We got down to 10 megawatts, I think, using point designs with a methane propellant. I suspect if we went to ammonia and really gave it a good try, we'd be able to get down to the megawatt level, which is you can actually buy a megawatt millimeter wave source. It's called a gyrotron. Yeah, we bought one. Yeah, we, yeah, that's right. We went through that whole debacle, as one does. Okay, so that pretty conveniently takes me to uh, my first question. <laughs> you said methane propellant, and then you mentioned uh, ammonia. It seems like there are lots of options here. Um, they just need to have a low molecular mass. And so I, would, I, I wonder if the environmental impact on the atmosphere might also be an important consideration with methane being uh, an aggressive greenhouse gas and... Uh, Ammonia maybe also not being so great, I don't know. Uh, but what are the other options that are uh, a bit more uh, acceptable or, or uh, it don't sound so nasty? Or is it that in reality, the, the mass of propellant that you actually need is so minimal that it doesn't matter? Yeah, no, this is a very interesting question because there's a lot of new research that has come out looking at the sort of fragility of the stratosphere and especially with respect to carbon particulates. And that's actually the, the main reason I looked again at ammonia instead of methane. I just, at ground level, ammonia is just toxic to humans, right? It's not a good thing. And so I just ruled it out. I said, if we can use methane, then it's far preferable. But actually, I think if the sensitivity of the stratosphere to, to carbon particulates is borne out, right, it's, there's, it's a lot of simulations, but there needs to be more work done. But what are the alternatives? And I did think of water, but water is a terrible pro propellant. Even in a thermal system, it's, it's just not that great. Why? Well, the same mass as ammonia, no? Because for the most part, what you're trying to do is cram the most hydrogen atoms into whatever matrix you can make for it and that, that is stable. And you got you, that oxygen at atom is not what you want. You got, what is it? So two hydrogens and an oxygen. But if you've got ammonia, you've got one nitrogen and three hydrogens. Got it. When so you heat it, it up, it splits up and it's got it. Okay. Makes yeah. sense. So actually ammonia comes out top. And so I looked at it again, and especially with regard to atmospheric, stratospheric chemistry. And ammonia is a, a lot, I don't know if it's beneficial, but it's definitely a, a lot kinder seemingly, at least as far as that's understood right now. Um, it might turn out to be, uh, there's going to be a limit to what you can put through just in general, but it might turn out to be something that's a, a lot gentler. I want to say something about that briefly, which is I looked into this too, along with Kevin, because we were doing some consulting on this very thing. And there's a lot of politics involved in this, like as most things are with climate, there's a lot of science, there's a lot of unknowns in the science. And then there's a lot of people who just get agitated when they hear methane or whatever, and, and that they put a kibosh on this if they possibly can without really carefully analyzing the situation, particularly with respect to non-anthropogenic or other anthropogenic sources that aren't rockets, but that's well, well cut on that point. If, if you use methane and you're actually elevating it to these high temperatures and you're injecting it into the atmosphere, aren't you basically really going to get CO2 and, and water as the you might products? Do. I, you might do. First of all, it's going to decompose. So you'll have carbon particulates 
Which is actually, it would be a good thing because you can then make the propellant itself absorb microwaves without having to worry about coating tubes. And there's advantages to that. But yeah, I guess there's not oxygen available all the way up. And so okay, you're going to have... Minutes. Oh, sorry. We've got three more minutes. Is there another uh, question or two? From the audience, I think we're covered. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I would have just asked my standard FOSSA question, which is with, with Lysiath in particular, it's been in the FOSSA literature and in our archives for such a long time, especially because of the nanotechnology component uh, uh, of Lysiath. And so I'm just super curious if you were plotting like the next 10 to 15 years, what could we expect if you guys are successful? Leave us with like a carrot of hope here uh, at the end of it. I'm super, super eager to hear just like, if everything goes right, uh, where could we be in like about 15 years if this technology works out? This is for the rockets or the light sails or the inference engine? Light sails, rockets, three. which, which uh, if you want to take all three of them, go for it. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the light sails, but uh, frankly, all of them. Okay, so the next 15 years for the light sails, we're looking at solar system missions. Once you have, I, I think the rate determining step for a lot of these directed energy systems, be it the rockets or the light sails, has been the beam director, making a beam. And so I think... The big change, and you'll, you'll know it's really happening, is once you start to get these small-scale lasers that you can use to propel things. And we're aiming for a 2035 mission where you can send chipsets through the solar system. And that won't be, that'll be in the Northern Hemisphere likely. And maybe, actually, California is like the right uh, latitude for that. But subscale system that is, what is it, a few hundred megawatts, I think it was, that is capable of doing solar system missions. And you can send out chipsets like popcorn, basically, to every part of the solar system. You can look for hidden mass in the solar system. There's a big question. There might even be a black hole in the outer solar system, for all we know. But you can send stuff out there to start mapping the solar system gravitationally. You can start to think of all of these kinds of missions. If there's something interesting going on in Jupiter, I think there was like another collision with Jupiter that just we completely missed the other day. You can send something to go look. Okay, so maybe Alison, you want to ask your last questions or do you want to let Carol ask a question? She was like, raising her hand. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> Hi, good to see uh, you. Fascinating stuff. How fa what is the fraction of the speed of light that this light sail is going when it's doing solar system science? And are there relativistic effects basically on the, the time, right? Do you have time dilation? So for the solar system mission, the way it scales, I don't know if you can still see my screen. No. Yeah. Let's see. I think we're. I guess we're going to go a few minutes over, but let's wrap this up soon. But it's in here. That's the thing. That's the speed there. Can you see that? No. Nope. No. Nope. All right. Never mind. You have it's, to reshare. Uh, okay. You have to share your screen. I think. Yeah. I'm just working on that. Give me one moment. All right. Can you see it now? That's okay. Time. That's 100 AU per year, right there. So that's going three times. Oh, sorry, 30 times faster than New Horizons as it passed Pluto. So not big relativistic effects. It's just enough basically to be beyond what you can do with taking the biggest rocket you can and, and just burning as long and as hard as you can do and with all of the, the sort of the trajectory tricks thrown in. Okay, so it's still accelerating within the solar system. How, how far out does it actually still be able to see the beam that's accelerating? For this, so in the plane of the solar system, the, the way you optimize it is so that the beam director does not set as the Earth rotates. So it's actually accelerating quite fast, and it's, I, I think it's a few hours acceleration time, it, less than. I, uh, well, I've got the point design here, we can see. So it's a few so hours of light. Yeah, uh, so all the acceleration is close to Earth, basically, and then it just is cruise after that. Okay, <clears throat> okay, yeah, so there. it's as fast as it's going to get within a few hours of, life, uh, of light time. Yeah, there we are, four hours, and it's but 13 star, light seconds away. Star, isn't the star shot? Isn't the star shot much shorter than that because it's yeah it's ten much. minutes? Look, Allison, you got any last words? No, this was wonderful. I could go on all, all day <laughs> long, but thank you so much for joining. This was really cool, especially because we learned about yeah three big topics a lot in the span of just an hour. Thank you so much. Thank you. People want to get to good, you. Good to it's, see you, Kevin. You too. Is it, is it Kevin? Ed, how do we get to? How do people email you, Kevin? I would just go to my website and click on contact. And are you still in the Bay Area or? Yeah, I'm in San Francisco. All right, let's hang out again soon. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, thank you. And for I'm not in Panama. Make sure to tell all your space 
buddies about these meetings because it would be lovely to have an even larger audience. Although I'm glad to see the attendance we had today. Kevin was a, a bigger draw than usual. So cool. All right, Kevin, thank you very much. Allison, thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you all. Bye-bye.